Bigger is always better, or is it? Your home can almost certainly benefit from some amount of battery storage. I know mine has, but how do you work out how much storage you need? Today, I'm going to dive into the points I considered when adding storage, look at how much storage I went for. In the process, hopefully I'm going to arm you with all the information you need to work out how much storage you're likely to need for your home. On the face of it, this seems like it should be simple to work out, but there are lots of variables to consider and what's right for you might not be right for your next door neighbor in an identical house with identical consumption. Personal preference and your end goals are going to make a big difference to the decision. To know how much storage you're going to need, the best place to start is making sure you have as much data as possible on how much electricity you're currently consuming and if you have solar, how much you're producing. Ideally, you'll have details of what time of day that power is being consumed and produced. If you have a smart meter, you should already have all the data you need. Ideally, you'll have at least hourly data available to browse on your supplier's website. You could also use a CT clamp based energy meter to gather data. The only example I've used is the Shelly EM. I'll link down in the description. You'd need the 120 amp CT clamp version to monitor the tails coming out of your meter, but I'd just bite the bullet and get a smart meter. It'll allow you to take advantage of all the smart tariffs from suppliers like Octopus Energy. If you have solar, your inverter will probably have all the data you need. These usually use CT clamps to monitor your grid usage and will be able to show you the balance of how much power you're generating from solar, consuming from the grid and feeding back to the grid. In a perfect world, you're going to want to be able to see your consumption and generation data for a full year. For example, in our case, we have a 16 kilowatt air source heat pump. So our winter consumption is much higher than our summer consumption, which is annoying because summer is when the sun shines and solar works. Before working out how much battery capacity you need, it's important to understand what you want the storage to do for you. What's your use case? I think there are five main use cases. You might only want to support one, or like me, you might be aiming to support all five. The simplest and probably the most common are homes that have solar panels. Now obviously these only work during daylight hours, so adding storage allows you to charge a battery during the day and consume that free stored energy at night when the sun is not shining. Ideally, you'll have stored enough to get you all the way through to the sun coming up the next morning. Looking at your data, the goal here is relatively simple. During the day, you're hopefully producing more power than you're using and that energy is currently being exported for somewhere between nothing and not very much. Now look at your consumption for the period of darkness. If you want to minimize your storage costs and maximize your self consumption, the amount of storage you want is going to be roughly the smallest of the two numbers. For example, if you're exporting around eight kilowatt hours a day of solar and overnight you're consuming on average five kilowatt hours from the grid, then you'd be looking at five kilowatt hours of battery storage. But if on average, you're only exporting three kilowatt hours and consuming eight kilowatt hours at night, it might not be worth getting more than three kilowatt hours of storage as you're not going to fill that with your excess free solar. In that case, you might want to look at a larger battery and adding extra solar. An extension of this use case is having enough storage to cover periods of bad weather where the panels are not generating enough power to cover your daytime usage. In the UK, for example, it's not uncommon to have days of 100% cloud coverage in the middle of the summer, where your solar production would be severely constrained. Normally producing a lot more power than you consume, it could be worthwhile storing enough to cover a day or two worth of bad weather. But if you're only interested in saving money, this is unlikely to be cost effective, but might depend on your local weather conditions and how often you have really sunny weather followed by a day or two of cloudy weather. The focus of both these use cases is to maximize your consumption of solar energy and minimize your import to reduce costs. So the focus should be on the smallest battery that you can make good use of. The next use case is to cover power outages. With all the problems facing power generation and supply, this is becoming more of a concern. Even in countries like the UK, where the power grid has historically been reliable, massive underinvestment in infrastructure and power generation combined with the global volatility of gas is certainly worrying. I'm going to explain in a minute 
why you probably want to oversize your battery anyway and that will normally cover this use case especially when most setups are only going to allow a limited number of essential circuits to remain energized when there is a power cut. Time shifting your grid consumption is what I'm currently doing. I have solar planned but it's not installed yet. The goal here is to use as much cheap off-peak electricity as possible. You charge up your batteries at the off-peak cheap rate and use that stored power when it's expensive. The aim is to cover as much of the peak consumption from the batteries as possible. In the UK, this works best when using tariffs like Octopus Go or Intelligent Octopus from Octopus Energy. If you're thinking about signing up for Octopus, I'll leave a referral link in the description down below. If you use it, we both get a £50 account credit, so it's a win-win. This is also an easy use case to work out. All you're really looking at is your average peak consumption. In our case, that varies quite dramatically through the year, with the heat pump consuming a large amount of power over the colder months. The other variable that's important here is making sure that the batteries and inverter you install can charge the batteries during the off-peak period. If you're unable to fill the batteries to 100%, you're not going to be able to make full use of them. For Octopus Go, for example, the off-peak period is only four hours, so you have to be able to fill quite a lot of battery in quite a short space of time. Some people will try and tell you that time shifting by itself is a bad idea, but since November, I've essentially been paying 7.5 pence per kilowatt for almost all of my electricity, and have saved somewhere in the region of a thousand pounds. I estimate even without installing solar, I will save between one and a half and two thousand pounds per year. I'm going to make another video soon where I detail exactly how much my system cost and look at how much it saved me in more detail. You mash that subscribe button if you don't want to miss that. The last use case is the most extreme, where you're completely off grid and rely on solar and probably a diesel generator. Most homes are not going to be permanently off grid, but you might still want to design a system that could work off grid. So when the next disaster rocks up and the world falls apart, you're prepared. I think these cover most of the use cases for a home battery. You're likely to have at least one of these requirements. In my case, I'd ideally like a system that covers all of them. If you think I've missed out an obvious use case, let me know in the comments down below. Also, if you already have or are planning storage, let me know what use cases you're hoping to cover and what spec of system you've gone for or are planning. In the UK specifically, if you're looking at Octopus Go or Intelligent Octopus, you're going to have an EV. It's probably worth pointing out that you should exclude your EV charging from the numbers you use when calculating your battery storage. It's almost never going to be worth charging your EV from your home battery system. Most EVs are going to have batteries far larger than the average home battery, and it's going to be very inefficient to use solar to charge a home battery, then use that power to charge your car. If you're charging your EV from solar during the day, that should really be accounted for in the numbers you're looking at because it will have reduced the amount of electricity that you're exporting from solar. With an EV, vehicle to grid is emerging as an area of interest. It's something I don't know much about, but it's worth some research. It could allow you to use your EV battery to cover some of the most extreme use cases I've mentioned here and have a smaller home battery at a reduced cost. When it comes to batteries, you'd think more is always better, but home batteries are still very expensive. They take up a lot of space, they cost a lot of money. So it's important to try and find the right balance that best meets all of your requirements without requiring you to remortgage your house or build an extension to house the thing. Another point to consider when looking at batteries is that it's not just the storage capacity that matters. If you're looking to run any significant loads, you also need to pay attention to how much current you can charge and discharge from your batteries. Both the batteries and your inverter will have current limits that you need to consider. Taking my Pylontech US3000C batteries as an example, each battery module can charge and discharge at 37 amps, or about 1.8 kilowatts. With eight of them, the batteries can charge and discharge at 296 amps, or 14.4 kilowatts, on the DC side of the inverter. I have two Victron MultiPlus 2 5000 inverters and they can each charge at a max of 70 amps. So although the batteries could charge at almost 300 amps, I'm limited to 140 amps or 6.7 kilowatts per hour total. 
My eight 3.5 kilowatt hour batteries have a total capacity of 28 kilowatt hours. So at a charging rate of 6.7 kilowatts per hour from my inverters, it's no coincidence that it takes almost exactly four hours to charge the batteries. Four hours is the length of the off-peak window you get in the UK with Octopus Go. So the system was designed to support this. If I wanted to add more batteries and still charge them in the four hour off-peak window, I'd need to add an extra inverter. Once you've worked out how much capacity you need, it's important when looking at batteries to understand that the advertised capacity is not necessarily all usable capacity. I don't own a power wall, but I noticed they advertise a 13.5 kilowatt hour usable capacity. If that's true, the pack is probably more like 15 kilowatt hours, with 13.5 kilowatt hours of that being usable. My 3.5 kilowatt hour Pylontech batteries are advertised as 3.5 kilowatt hours each, with a max 95% depth of charge. So only about 3.3 kilowatt hours is actually usable. And in practice, even that would really stretch the batteries and reduce their lifespan. With their current settings, I've never seen mine get much lower than 10% before they give up. As the charge in lithium batteries reduces, their ability to deliver current also reduces. On my Pylontex, once you get below about 15%, their ability to each deliver 1.8 kilowatts reduces dramatically and attempting to draw high current causes the internal cell voltages to drop low enough that the batteries go into sustain mode, where the inverters start to trickle charge the battery. Reducing the minimum cell voltage setting in the Victron inverters or limiting the current draw would probably allow the batteries to get to the advertised 95% depth of discharge, but it's really not healthy for them, so I've not done it. So when sizing your battery system, it's probably always going to be a good idea to take what you think you're going to need and oversize it by 10 to 20 percent. The requirements and current usage is probably only going to give you a rough idea of how much storage you need. To make sure you end up with the correct amount of storage, it's a good idea to make sure the battery system you select is easily expandable. They're almost all expandable to some degree, but take a power wall for example with its 13.5 kilowatt hour capacity, you can always add extra power walls but only in 13.5 kilowatt hour increments and at huge cost. They're also certainly not plug and play. The Pylon Tech batteries that I've got here sit at the opposite end of the spectrum where you can easily add extra batteries at much smaller 2.4, 3.5 or 5 kilowatt hour increments. Having an easily extendable system allows you to undersize the system on purpose. This allows you to reduce your initial upfront cost and use your experience of the system to work out the perfect amount of storage for you. So to summarize, dig into your data, ensure you have a good idea of your grid consumption and if you have solar, your production. Decide what use cases you want to support with your batteries. Use your production and consumption data to work out how much storage you need to support your essential use cases. Add between 10 and 20% depending on the spec of the battery. Make sure the batteries you buy can supply enough current for your needs. Lastly, remember you probably won't get this decision perfect initially, so go for a system that can be easily extended in the future. If this video has helped you out, it would really mean a lot to me if you could take a second and consider subscribing. Please also leave a comment if you have any questions I've not answered in the video. I do try to answer every comment. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.